proverbs always seem more flavoursome than your own. An opening Idris Shah's new collection of general pungencies drawn from the Eastern mystics. I was hooked the moment my eye fell on the unforgettable rumination. The scorpion doesn't look much in between stings. I continue to be struck by the delightful resonance of the proposition, if you can't lie down, you will stand up once too often. These are epitomies, but there are also longer pieces in the collection, and one might call those epiphanies, in the sense that Joyce used the word, a showing forth, in which the true nature of something or someone is revealed. Idris Shah, perhaps you'd pick one out and read it to us. I have a story here called The Strange Becomes Commonplace, in which uh, a scholar asked the great sage Afzal of Iskandaria, what can you tell me of Ali Mazimi, your teacher, to whom you attribute qualities which have fashioned you? Afzal answered, his poetry intoxicated me, and his love of mankind suffused me, and his self-sacrificing services elated me. The scholar said, such a man would indeed be able to fashion angels. Afzal continued, those are the qualities which would have recommended Arlim to you. Now for the qualities which enabled him to help men transcend the ordinary. Hazrat Arlim Azimi made me irritated, which caused me to examine my irritation, to trace its source. Arlim Azimi made me angry, so that I could feel and transform my anger. Arlim Azimi allowed himself to be attacked so that people could see the bestiality of the attackers and not join with them. He showed us the strange, so that the strange became commonplace, and we could realise what it really is. Thank you. Now, Pat Williams, I know you're going to ask some questions. Yes, I think the first question to be asked really is, the word Sufi and the word Dervish appear in the book frequently and seem almost interchangeable, but in fact there must be a distinction. What is it? Yes, well, first perhaps one ought to say that there is a famous dictionary definition of Sufi, uh, which says merely a Sufi is a Sufi. But uh, beyond that, we could say something about how we understand it as Sufis. Generally speaking, a dervish is considered to be a humble man. A dervish is a man who may belong to an order of people, people living according to a rule, who wish to discipline themselves or enlighten themselves or something like that. A dervish is very often a simple man. And the word is used in Persian to mean he's a simple man, he's a dervish, he's a good man. Now, a Sufi is uh, a man who is perhaps more of a philosopher, perhaps uh, more of the kind of philosopher that you think of when you say a philosophical person. So one is a good man and the other one is a philosopher, mm -hmm. you might almost say. That's as near as we can get to it in English without a cultural context. And the idea of the Victorian image of the dervish as the wild woolly man is... A mistake, is it? Or? Well, I think it's rather due to this unfortunate um, incident in the Sudan when the people uh, who fought there were uh, called dervishes. And uh, mind you, they didn't call themselves dervishes very much because it's a Persian word and Sufi is an Arabic word. But they were rather dreadful and they did fight and they did wear patched cloaks and they did originate in a religious ecstatic movement. So the image came to England in that way and generally to the West. Mm. I am dealing mainly with the Sufi literature of the past thousand years. They um, flourished, and they do still flourish, in the Middle East, and particularly from the 8th century of the Christian era. When Robert Robinson introduced your book, he mentioned mystics. And in fact, although the strange is in these tales, it is in there as the commonplace, as something which is familiar and can be understood by material which is very often right under one's nose. Yeah. And um, I was wondering whether mystic was a term which was appropriate for these tales. Yes. Well, in a sense, yes, in a sense, no. Um, it all depends what you mean by mystic. Mm. Well, I certainly didn't mean mysterious. No. What I meant was no. a capacity to see the essence of what yes. the ordinary uh -huh. is. Ah, oh, well, that is how As the William Blake said, it. you can stare at a knot of wood until it frightens you. Exactly. That's how the Sufi would see it. Now, there's a very nice paradox in this book. The Dermis Probe, which gives the book its name, is a film script for a film which was shown both at the London and New York film festivals and was called an outstanding film. And it's, in fact, a space satire, but it's based on a story 700 years old, at least. And um, in the credit titles, J.D. Rumi of Konya and H.M. Sanai of Ghana 
are given credit and are made to feel like very contemporary people working now. They've helped in the script. And it seems to me that this is the thing about your book. It's old stories from the East, but in fact they're dealing with the future or, you know, the immediate next minute for the West. And there is this tremendous practical flavour which makes them accessible to anybody. Would you agree? Is well, I'm becoming more and more gratified by the numbers of people who are saying these things because this is really what one has intended all along, not just to be some funny little Oriental coming and amusing you by the uh, uh, strange things about the mysterious East. Mm. I'm most interested to see whether I can be useful. And very often one sees that uh, Western psychological research in the laboratories and by experts in the field are coming to the same kind of conclusions in different ways. Uh, there's one story uh, in the book called The Gifts, which you point out, this is so, this kind of material is being taken by Western researchers. Yes, indeed. But I think I should enter a, a warning against reading the book all at yes. once, because if you do, uh, you start to become very sufficiently irritated by what seems to be the complacency of the man cast in the role of the wise man, who, and the Sufi never says, I don't know, unless it actually means something rather better than I do know. And uh, the, the Philistine, everyone else is cast as the Philistine, and it seems as though the area of Philistinism and stupidity and opacity in the, in the poor, humble questioner who comes along is deliberately enlarged so that the role of the wise man shall be the more impregnable. So I would have thought that read half a dozen at a time and then put it aside. Yes, of course, I am not, don't know whether I am here to defend the book, but uh, if I were to be allowed to say something, I think it might be constructive to say that if you were to take a book of multiplication tables uh, and complain that uh, they were too perfect, it would uh, be uh, an adequate... It, uh, uh, an entirely sufficient parallel, absolutely. It just occurs to me that uh, when you were referring just now to the relevance of these Sufi tales to the West, you know, that this reference to the ability to see the uh, strange as commonplace is really a description of the achievement of science and the intention of art. Oh yes, I very much agree. Entirely. That's why I think uh, it is possible for me to operate in this uh, climate. Yes. Uh, because something can be introduced for which there are already roots. Yes, it's it not an importation of anything. It seemed to me from reading these tales that the basic attitude implied there is that attitude of the scientist who has to take the evidence as it comes and somehow change his m method of thought to suit the evidence. I'm Not overjoyed to hear to that, to really. I'm so delighted to hear you say that. I don't know whether this is a good thing or a bad thing or a no thing, but I found one or two of the proverbs that the exact opposite of the, what they said was just as wise, if not wiser, than, uh, than the first version. For instance, whoever is to be wise despises himself, only the ignorant trust their own judgment. Well, conversely, whoever is to be wise will not despise himself. I mean, that is psychologically apt, is it, is, is it not? Only the ignorant do not trust their own judgment. I think you're absolutely right, and I think this holds for all proverbs. My own opinion about proverbs is that they are something to hold up and look at so that uh, you, you should be able to look at both sides. I think it's probably a degeneration of proverbs that we only look at one side and regard them as encapsulated wisdom. I regard them as exercises, a point of view which you may hold for a moment and look at, and you may also surely be allowed to look at the opposite and see whether it's equally true. Mm. I remember Desmond Morris said once on a, a book programme like this that your stories were interesting to him when he had already had an experience rather like it, and then he was able to look at the story and say, aha, I see. And it strikes me that there's a whole um, field of human activity which is common to all of us and which is so ordinary in a way, which no one's ever bothered to observe and codify in a sense, except I find it here. Well, I don't is think so much work has probably been done on it here, but uh, you do find this in English literature and even uh, vulgar tales and in jokes and in stories of the wise men of Gotham <laughs> or the Emperor's New Clothes, all that, all that sort of literature contains mm. these sort of column insights or attitudes, I think. So it's here. I wonder if you'd read us, if you'd pick another one out and give us another taste. Well now, can you suggest one? There's one on pomegranates here, which is perhaps quite amusing. Very modern. I think I should say that uh, a lot of these I've uh, taken from oral tradition by sitting and listening to storytellers. And sometimes people have just come up to me and told me a story and then 
stood up and gone away. This is something which tends to happen to me in the East, I'm uh, glad to say, but it's very odd. Now, this one, I was told uh, by a man in Baghdad. It's called pomegranates. A uh, disciple went to the house of a Sufi physician and asked to become an apprentice in the art of medicine. You are impatient, said the doctor, and you will fail to observe things which you will need to learn. But the young man pleaded, and the Sufi agreed to accept him. After some years, the youth felt that he could exercise some of the skills which he had learned. One day a man was walking towards the house, and the doctor, looking at him in the distance, said, That man is ill. He needs pomegranates. You've made the diagnosis. Let me prescribe for him, and I'll do half the work, said the student. Very well, said the teacher, providing that you remember that action should also be looked on as illustration. As soon as the patient arrived at the doorstep, the student brought him in and said, You're ill. Take pomegranates. Pomegranates, shouted the patient. Pomegranates to you. Nonsense. And he went away. The young man asked the master what the meaning of the interchange had been. I will illustrate the next time we get a similar case, said the Sufi. Shortly afterwards, the two were sitting outside the house when the master looked up briefly and saw a man approaching. Here's an illustration for you. A man who needs pomegranates, he said. The patient was brought forward and the doctor said to him, You are a difficult and intricate case. I can see that. Let me see. Yes, you need a special diet. This must be composed of something round, something with small sacks inside, naturally occurring. An orange, that would be the wrong colour. Lemons are too acid. I have it. Pomegranates. The patient went away delighted and grateful. But master, said the student, why did you not say pomegranates straight away? Because, said the Sufi, he needed time as well as pomegranates. <laughs> <laughs>